and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Rina Ramkumar, and with me today is the one and only Nikolai Herman. Hi, everyone. So, you know, the other day, Nico and I started to chatting about careers and life after a PhD because, uh, to be honest, we're both towards the, the end of our PhD careers and we're looking forward to what the big wide world out there is, has to offer us. And since we both kind of considered a career in science as well, so postdocing is, you know, clearly one of the options after a PhD. So with that in mind, we just started to having a big discussion, right, Nico? Exactly. And so that's why for this episode, we want to try to maybe put together our point of view and uh, try to inform you about the potential things you can uh, get as a postdoc for funding opportunities. Exactly. So we basically started to discuss about postdoc grants and postdoc funding opportunities. And this is basically the same discussion that we're going to have. And stick around with us and we'll be back right after this little bit of music that you're all well aware of. All right, so um, as to start the discussion, we first wanted to maybe give you our point of view of why we want to maybe stay in science, why do a postdoc, um, and how you should approach it. And then, uh, of course, uh, as everything in this world, um, nothing is for free. So in order to get your postdoc funded, there's like certain things that uh, you should uh, keep in mind and also as it always translates into later uh, stages in, of a scientific career. So this, uh, with this, maybe we can start about uh, like um, thoughts on staying in science. So what do you think about that? I mean, definitely, if you really feel passionate about the research you're doing and about certain science, for example, I'm in the biomedical section and I really, really enjoy doing research and I, and I find it fascinating, like finding new things is really, really interesting. But on the other hand, I'm also really sort of drawn towards doing work in a different direction as well. For example, science communication work, I'm also interested in that. But I would really consider a career in postdoc or, or to do a postdoc because for me, at least the science speaks a lot. It speaks volumes and it's about how passionate you are about the research you're doing. So that leads me into thinking about doing a postdoc. And as soon as I start thinking about postdocs and I see the postdocs around me in the lab and in my institute, we start to notice that, hey, okay, these guys, they they have to apply for so many grants and they, 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 they are, they're constantly under pressure. I mean, a lot more and the postdocs a lot more undefined than a PhD, right? Or at least PhD has like a, like an end date where you get your degree, but you don't get anything at the end of a postdoc except I guess valuable life experience and more independence, I would say, but you cannot quantify that. I mean, I think that's, that's where these grants and all these funding opportunities come into picture. I mean, I think the postdoc gives you more than just um, just the just the time you spend in the lab and doing more experiments. Because as a postdoc, I think one important thing um, that you have to do is take up more responsibility. And I think this uh, basically managing people um, is very important. So this will not be a skill that you will. Um, hmm, that you won't need later and or in different um, work environments. So managing people, I think, is always important. So if you can do that during a postdoc, I think that was very good. And I mean, for me, uh, so just coming back to thoughts about staying in science. Um, so I've always kind of wanted to stay in science. And I mean, the further I've been going into my PhD, the more, uh, I mean, you realize how tough it actually is. And as you said, also seeing the postdocs around me, it's not that it's uh, going to be a piece of cake 
um, to have an academic career. And yeah, that's why, I mean, I think it's good to uh, still keep uh, other open uh, options open. So having a plan B, C, D, and so on, just to be sure that uh, you won't land on the street at some point. For sure. I doubt with a PhD one is uh, going to land on the street. But I mean, yeah, you just need to keep your eyes open and look for opportunities that really interest you. Anyway. So this brings us into one important topic for a postdoc, which is funding, right? We need to really keep in mind how we're going to get funded and why it's necessary to do a postdoc to get a get a different perspective, I guess, or like, you know, either in, in a topic which is different from what you were doing during your PhD or maybe in a different country to get to know the ways it's different in the other country or maybe also just using the, the you're working in the same sort of field but uh, using different models or different mechanisms for that matter so i think to be honest there's already some uh, like some pi positions uh, or junior research group leaders that exist that you can take after your phd so it's not that this is unheard of although it's very rare i would say um, but I think the postdoc, I mean, why would you actually do it? Uh, if you want, uh, like, why is it part of academia? Um, so in my opinion, it's because now after your PhD, you actually know about science, at least to some extent, you're, um, knowledgeable about the field you worked in, you know, how science works, you published hopefully a paper. And so you got like the gist of what you're getting yourself into. And now as a postdoc, you can actually orient yourself in the direction that you want to go in later, because um, during your PhD, you can might still be in a field that maybe you realized you don't like so much. So if you then do a postdoc and then you find the field that you actually want to work in, you can already learn all the methods and get into the literature and uh, know all the um, know the whole field already before starting a PI or starting your own lab. Because then if you'd have to learn all the methods from scratch, that would be really tough. You couldn't teach the PhD students then, uh, but rather you'd have to learn it yourself first. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why postdocs do make sense when you want to stay in academia. And also the second thing is just the people skills, right? And then now, of course, like concerning then the um the funding i think this is also one of the things that um is more common right that you get postdocs fellowships versus phd fellowships and i think the biggest difference between postdoc and phd is that independence is uh, necessary for postdocs so i don't think you want your pi to be uh hovering over you all the time telling you okay now you need to do that experiment and that experiment but rather you want to develop your own ideas and uh, pursue them and that is why i think uh, having your own funding makes it a bit more easy as you're not tied to the pi in this sense yeah definitely and also one needs to add that there's this prestige factor to getting certain grants and certain fundings because these are not easy tasks right like you need to formulate the plan get the idea do the literature uh, re do the literature review and then come up with a plan of action on how you're going to go about doing the experiment basically it's a lot of work for the mind which is essentially what being a pi is as well <laughs> Right, it's it's a lot less work for the body and more for the mind, as a scientist. So I I guess that's what leads us to start thinking about the different funding opportunities that's available for a postdoc. For example, you you may be doing research in a in a sort of field which is rather uh, easy to get funding in in the, in the sense that because there's a lot of demand. So, but uh, and you may also be doing research in fields where it's quite, quite, really, really challenging to get because of the sparsity of such grants. So, I mean, it might be interdisciplinary, it might be risky, and so in a lot of lot of deadlines. So, I think these are a lot of things that people need to be aware of, which you don't face so much on a daily or a weekly basis when you're doing a PhD. 
First of all, maybe we should uh, be talking about what types of funding exist, right? Uh, I think just to get like a, a common ground. So um, I think the, the type that you were also describing more now is this long-term funding. So this is like a, a postdoc fellowship. And this is something, uh, as uh, we understand, is like something you get for two to three years, uh, which pays your salary and also maybe some additional things. And then on the other hand, there is the more short term funding. Like, for example, you need like a certain equipment that costs like, I don't know, $50,000. And then you just get a, a grant, a smaller grant just for that thing. And actually, then more recently, I also heard about something that you can do when you're already more in your postdoc. Uh, so it's um, something where you can apply for some funding for a sub project or a side project and then just get funding independently of your PI and of your own salary just for that project. So I think these different kinds of uh, funding um, exist and I would separate them because they are used for different things. Yeah, definitely. So let's maybe then uh, go right back into this long-term funding thing. Um, so yeah, as, as Serena uh, just, uh, mentioned, like all types of funding require you to apply for it, right? So this means writing an application, a proposal that, and then I think one of the most important things is just to see what um, they require because they're usually quite different. And I mean, having also talked to um, uh, Ino Agrafiotti, uh, I hope that's her yeah. name. Yeah, so uh, that was the episode with the ERC where it's about exactly. the PI startup grant. Yes, but even, I mean, before that, so uh, you will have to do some kind of risk assessment or knowing how risky your project is because the different um, fellow of funders will have want different kinds of uh, risky projects. So while the one wants really wants you to explore like something that has never been done before, um, one, so basically being very risky, uh, the other one might require you to have like a more safe project or at least a starting point that is very safe and then getting more risky the further you go on. And I think this is very important when you are to pay attention to when you write this uh, proposal. At least that's what I've heard so far. So how about we start giving a few examples of, let's say, long-term proposals first, and then we can give a few examples maybe from our fields about these short-term proposals as well, so that people are aware what what is out there and what they can apply to. Why don't you get started, Nico? Yes. So, I mean, one thing that I heard of was this Human Frontier Science Program. So this is, I mean, I have to admit most of the things that we will talk about will be focused more on the biomedical section. And just to jump in a little bit and mention that in case there are opportunities from the other sections that people would like to share, please feel free to post when we make a post for this episode on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Please make sure to comment and let us know about different granting opportunities in other fields and other sections and also other like for example if there's something that your lab is aware of and uh, that that you think should be well known with the community please make sure to comment that and we'd be very happy to share that with the audience yeah thanks for the input um, yeah, so coming back to the Human Frontier Science Program, so as uh, I uh, looked into it a bit, and they have two uh, main postdoc fellowships. So on the one hand, there's this long-term fellowship, which is uh, called, uh, which is for people from a background in the biological sciences, and then they have a cross-disciplinary um, fellowship, which is for people that are have studied math, physics, computer science, or engineering, and want to switch to uh, some of the bio biological sciences and each of them as far as I remember are three years long and uh, they give you the basic salary and then um, yeah you get like maybe some opportunities to get additional funding for conferences and such 
And um, but so the thing is, they also require some things when you want to apply. So, for example, you need to change the country. Um, you can't stay in the same country as the uh, one where you did your PhD. On the other hand, they also want uh, you to be, you know, be a starting postdoc. So it's not possible for you to apply if you have already done a year of postdoc, but rather you need to do it in the first year. And lastly, because it's quite competitive, um, they also only want or allow one applicant per year per lab. So it's good to coordinate with your postdoc lab uh, how many people want to apply to this because you can only have one person get it in the end. That's why it makes sense to coordinate with them and see uh, what the situation is like. So this is roughly an, uh, the this uh, human HFSP fellowship. Yeah, it's an interesting, uh, interesting one, actually, the Human Frontier Science Project. This actually sort of, it makes me think about the opportunities within Europe because there are so many countries within Europe and there are a lot of opportunities from European funders. So one thing which is uh, really, which really strikes a card is the Marie Curie uh, Actions Individual Fellowship, which is a, a very European specific funding uh, opportunity. So basically it can fund your postdoc for up to three years. So basically people who are eligible are individuals who you know who want to apply for a European fellowship if they're moving after their PhD or, or after four years of uh, full-time research experience and they move into the European Union or associated countries of the EU or if they're interested in moving to the EU they can apply for this fellowship but the alternative is is that who researchers are currently based in the EU or associated countries can also apply for a global fellowship to do a part of their research outside of Europe for a year or two and then return for their last year to an European Union country. And basically, this is a very nice way to promote inter international collaboration and interdisciplinary research as well. So I think this is one very nice uh, funding opportunity that I came across for the postdocs. Yeah, I heard it's also quite prestigious and um, people there are like usually like the cream of the crop that get this fellowship. Yeah, so you have any anything else you want to share, Nico? Um, well, I guess there's also one uh, other fellowship, which is um, maybe more interesting for the German people. Um, so which is called the Walter Benjamin program. And this is um, funding for two years. Um, and uh, this, can, I think, is mainly for people going outside of Germany. So if you did your PhD in Germany, and actually there's one requirement, which is that you have to do at least three years of research in Germany before you can get it. And then you can go abroad for two years and you get funding. One thing I heard about it, though, is that you still need a German bank account. So they won't transfer it uh, to the other universities, but rather you would have to maintain your German bank account and they only uh, transfer it to that. So there might be some additional things you have to uh, like communicate to your university. Well, these are these are very interesting rules. Of course, there is definite cost to science, and this is this is kind of the cost that you come across. I I mean another one for people who are in the in the field of biological sciences. I'm so I suppose everyone's aware of the European Molecular Biology Organization. So they offer long term fellowships with stipends for twelve to twenty four months. And actually, I know that people in my lab. A couple of postdocs in my lab are currently EMBO fellows, and it, it, it's very nice to discuss with them on how they went about doing their application procedure. And basically, this is for postdocs as soon as finishing their PhDs who go into research and doing a postdoc, and you have to apply for this within two years of receiving a PhD and having at least one first author publication accepted. Or published. So this publication clause is important. So we'll be posting links to all of these, all of the grants that we're talking about now in the show notes. And if you're interested in any of them, please make sure to check them out. And we'll also be putting a list of what we've gathered from our research. So you should also check that out if you're interested in any of these postdocs. 
funding opportunities. Yeah, one more thing maybe that we should mention is that, uh, I mean, usually when you're part of uh, any of these fellowships, it's not just you that uh, by yourself, but usually a cohort of people getting uh, funding every year. And as far as I remember, um, there are yearly meetings. Um, so there's like a conference for all the fellows and they come together. So it's also a nice opportunity actually to meet other people um, that got the fellowship and also build up your network of scientists. And um, yeah, so with this, of course, you then have to present your research. So you do have to follow up on, uh, on your proposal. So ideally you can fulfill it completely, but um, I mean, of course, uh, research might change and you might head into a completely different direction because uh, it didn't work out the way it was written. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these applications also have those uh, clauses in there in case things change, in case... I mean, of course, we all know that science isn't exactly the way we imagine it, right? I mean, that is one thing that you learn from being a master's student, doing an internship, and then getting into a PhD where you're sort of uh, knocking on a door and then this door doesn't open or the door opens and it's completely something else that rather than what you expected on the other side. So, yeah, so this is something that we really need to keep in mind. And also the granting organizations have also kept this in mind as they have established these funding opportunities for people. So just be, feel free to communicate with the responsible parties and make sure to read all the grant-related documents carefully. My God, I'm sounding like a mutual fund investment uh, uh, announcer. Anyway, so I, I kind of want to take a quick sidebar into these short-term fellowships, the one Nico briefly mentioned before, because another thing that came to mind was one of the fellowships that people at my institute actually apply, because I'm at a research institute for heart and lung research. So there's the German Heart and uh, Heart and Lung Research Center, so the DZHK, and they offer basically smaller grants of 60,000 or 70,000 euros a year for basically having technical assistance and for consumables or for ec smaller equipment costs. So these are another source of potential, how do you call it, like prestige, which, you, which you're supposed to be applying for. They really want applications and they send out calls every year. So make sure to keep an eye out on the notice board. So. We've, we've mentioned a few, but these are not all. There are millions and millions of opportunities out there for everyone. So just a few words of caution from people, we've, from people we've spoken to and a bit of research that we've done on this topic is most people always tell us that we should be very aware of our deadlines, right? Yeah, and I mean, just before we uh, move on, I would also mention one more uh, short term uh, fellowship or more of a different type of uh, fellowship, I guess, which is called the Klaus Chira Boost Fund. So this is apparently some kind of um, grant that you can get as a postdoc. And um, this will be also paid out over the over two years, but it's more for like a side project. Uh, so I've only heard about it actually today, talking to a postdoc in the lab um that uh, they exist and uh yeah that's basically to allow the postdoc to have their own funding and project already um so that they don't have to rely on the pi and one thing that also came in this discussion with him was that uh i think one thing that it's a bit less uh how should i say comfortable but uh, so apparently there's also a lot of awards that exist for young scientists but um, that you can apply for and say, okay, you deserve this award for those and those reasons, and you can show them your CV and whatever, uh, whatever they need. And it's also, it's also worth applying for those, even though you might think that you might not get it. But um, still being able to value your own research, whatever you did, and applying for them, I think is good. And if you get them in the end, it's even better, right? I mean, of course, there's a bit of a monetary reward, but then on the other hand, you also get the prestige and all of these things, um, which definitely would help you in a scientific career and also in another one, I would guess. Yeah, definitely. And speaking to different postdocs, we also got to know that 
the grant writing basically is a is a is a very 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 important task and a lot of lot of grant opportunities for postdocs and it's also like a teaser to careers as as bi not everyone is a max planck director so most people who have pi positions have to apply for grants to secure funding for their research i, I mean it's a scientific endeavor is i, I would say it's slightly slightly broken because you know it's like joining a fire brigade and you'll have to get money to get the trucks to get the water to get the buckets to get the hose and everything but that is how science is and it, it basically teaches a valuable lesson that nothing comes for free because you're doing something out of your passion so because of this just make sure you just take your time and really do all the groundwork necessary to write the research proposals that you're looking for and basically start doing it as soon as you know that this is something that you want to apply for and have some sort of an inkling towards an idea for for research i mean definitely your current pi or your future pi would definitely be willing to help you identify how to do this and maybe even support you with experience from former lab members who've secured these grants so basically do not hesitate to contact yeah yeah especially since you mentioned the deadlines before like um as we mentioned in the hfsp like you only can only apply in the first year and then so postdoc fellowships usually so or especially the more early ones you can only apply them in the first or the first two maybe years and then also thinking a bit more in the in the future like a lot of um starting grants for PIs, as we also discussed with um, the ERC um, person, Ino Agrafiotti, that you can only apply between two and seven years after your PhD is done. So as soon as you're, uh, you defend, you get a date on your certificate for your PhD, and this date counts as a, the starting point. So as soon as you get the date, the clock starts ticking, ticking for all the fellowships and the starting grants for later on. So it's really good to, um, first of all, keep those deadlines in mind, but also uh, write the research proposals a bit ahead of time so that you don't you can put them away for a week, uh, think about it again, and then come back to it again instead of having to rush and write it uh, within like a week or so. And importantly, don't hesitate to ask for information. I'm sure most of these granting committees have people who are willing to have discussions to to clarify any doubts that you have and also there are a lot of lot of sources of information on more grants we'll definitely put the links in our description down below and if you have any ideas for grants in different fields and different aspects please feel free to post that also on the comments of our twitter linkedin or instagram posts and we'd be more than happy to share them to everybody out there, do also let us know what you think about uh, doing next in your career after your PhD. Do you want to do a postdoc? Do you want to start a career in academia? Do you think outside academia the opportunity is better for you? Just let us know in the comments. We'd be very happy to hear that as well. And I guess that's pretty much all the information from us. If this episode you felt was slightly dry and didn't have... <laughs> a lot of interesting conversation i'm sure you'd appreciate the amount of information we shared with you if you're truly applying for a postdoc but anyway yeah i mean i hope that this information will help someone or anyone uh, to at least uh, get an idea of what um, kind of uh, is expected of them during their postdoc and yeah i mean we'll both be going potentially through this phase uh, within a year so Maybe we can do a, an update at some point. Yeah, maybe. Maybe the future generation of the Offering Podcast is willing to have us back. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Anyway, the future is in the balance, as it always is. And I guess with that, it's pretty much time to end. I'm so happy that uh, we got to learn about all these things today. Nico, thanks a lot for doing this episode. And... Uh, uh, joining us on this journey through the minefield that is postdoc startup grants. Yes, it was nice. I think this is a very important topic, and um, if 
people are interested in science, it would be a shame if they just won't be able to stay because uh, they miss the deadlines or don't know about the potential opportunity. Yes. And we talk so much about careers outside science, I guess. Careers in science also are important to talk about. And this is one of those topics which is in that direction. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. If not, stay with us. Next week is definitely going to be a very interesting episode as well. And do you want to add anything else, Nico? I think, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's any questions, whatever, please feel free to contact us. We will be happy to help you out. And I think with this, we can come to an end. Yeah, if you feel the energy levels are a bit low, you should keep in mind that we are recording this at 11.30 in the night. So, well, there you have it. These are late night topics indeed. Anyway, (laughs) thanks a lot for joining us and hope to see you all next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye bye. Bye. Officer Magazine, the podcast, party with Max Planck, PhD, and Science Communication Working Group, Max Officer Magazine. The intro, outro music, composition, and the printer printer jingle comes with Gustav Carito. If you'd like to give any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mbg.de. And with that, I bid you adieu on behalf of Nico and myself for this episode, and see you all next week. Bye bye.